Steve, what's up, man? My brother, my brother. How are you? Uh, I'm really good, man. Thank you for being so patient with me. I think we had to move this thing twice. Um, and, you know, I didn't, you know, when I was uh, talking to Swin, your wife, I didn't move that one. You know, you never, you never, you never <laughs> move wife. You don't move never, wife. Never, never, never. And thank you for yeah. that. And it kept no. her happy home. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Man, I got so many questions for you. I want to, but I want to jump right into it because, you know, I was interviewing Chauncey. Did you see that one I did with Chauncey, who's over yes. at um, uh, Pepsi? Pepsi, uh, yep. So many people learn from him. Um, and the reason why I want to point out that, you know, executives like you and Chauncey and and people of color who are behind the scenes moving uh, um, and um, uh, pulling a lot of the strings, people don't get to see who you are. You know, you, they just see the brand, but they don't realize the brand has bases behind them. And, and the way that you think and you unravel things in such a – calculated way because you're representing fortune 500 companies you know listen i go out there and i i want to put out a you know something i'm the boss it's my brand right and and i don't i don't have a fortune 500 company i don't have shareholders i don't have people who can potentially litigate because it's the wrong thing where you left somebody out you guys got a lot of roadblocks that you have to deal with so um i, I want people to get to see and get to hear the way that you think whether you're on the brand side or sometimes when you are on the pitching side, representing them. So I wrote down a couple of questions, and I'm just going to really ask you for it about it. So first of all, I want to talk to you about HBCU Change. What what motivated you to create this um, this product that basically all your spare change or any uh, you know your spare change can go to uh, HBCUs after you purchase something? What motivated you to do that? And, and tell me the process on how you how you created it. Absolutely. So this this platform was two years in the making. As you know, in business, you know, number one rule is you try to fill a void. You try to solve a problem, right? And when you think about HBCUs and the issues that they're facing today, especially with COVID, there are some underlying things that were they were facing prior to COVID, but during COVID, it's, it's taking it tenfold, right? So when you think about HBCUs, they're, um, they're facing dropout rates that are unprecedented because students can't go on campus. So what does that do? That impacts you know, dollars that are coming on to the to the universities. When you think about giving back, right, um, for a PWI, a predominantly white institute, um, you know, in their coffers, they'll have about an average $350 million that they could bank on if something goes wrong, right? This is people donating, giving back throughout the years. For an HBCU, the average is $8 million. So there's a huge gap when you think about who's giving back. So what do we do? We uh, interviewed 5,000 uh, alumni of HBCUs and asked them, number one, why don't you give back? And their response is where we never been asked. And two is we didn't feel as if we can give back enough to make a difference because you often see these one-time big donations to these HBCUs. So we wanted to create a solve for the HBCU. So we did, we did some research. We got some of the best technology folks who, who develop apps and tried to come up with an app that could give back seamlessly without you having to think about it and feeling bad if you're not giving a hundred thousand dollar check or a million dollar check so through hbcu change it rounds up to the nearest dollar so through every transaction that you make if you buy a cup of coffee for three dollars and fifty cents that fifty cents will roll up to four dollars and it'll go to the hbcu of your choice there's 103 accredited hbcus so if you want to donate to clark if you want to donate to dillard if you want to donate to morehouse if you want to donate to spellman whichever hbcu it is you can do that through this app you link your cards and it rolls up and donates right to the university you know and i think that's incredible because first of all you, you you obviously shared the plight but a lot of people right now like i've learned with bombers a lot of people right now go you know what I can buy something from anybody at any time, but now I want to know that when I buy something, that that person is doing better for the world and is making the world a better place. So uh, could people use this app and actually put it on to their site for, um, let's say, a lot, of, a lot of my people here have their own Shopify pages and various other things. Can they do that as well? Because... I think, listen, at the end of the day, what I love now and where people can learn from you right now is, uh, you know, even if they have a brand or a product, make sure your product aligns itself with something that you are truly passionate about that you know does well for the world. Because people love to, as I've said it a million times, tomorrow, Thanksgiving, when somebody's out there saying, well, I gave away turkeys yesterday, which, which hopefully would be great, or they worked at a pantry or various other things, 
somebody may be sitting at the table and they say, well, I gave a hundred times this year. How did you give a hundred times? Cause every time I, every time I bought this, uh, my spare chain went to a HBCU. Every time I bought this, I helped stop human trafficking. And every time I bought this, I helped take illegal guns off the streets. Right. So I think that this is really great and people can learn from your need to want to help solve a problem. So many of us think that what we do doesn't necessarily matter unless we do it big, but if everybody right. does it a little, it creates significant, significant change. And to that point, you know, we'll use, you know, Clark Atlanta as, a, as an example. They have 40,000 alumni, right? If we get a quarter of that, 10,000 people who are connected to HBCU change and giving back, collectively that 10,000 can be giving back, you know, uh, five, up to $5 million a year to that HBCU, specifically by just connecting to the platform. And it's your change. You know, through our research, it said if you connect your debit card and your credit card, it'll average between 50 and $80 a month that you're giving back to your HBCU. If a quarter of the 40,000 alumni base, 10,000, are all connected, that's going to average to $5 million that's going back to their HBCU. So collectively, you can move. And to, to the point of, you know, alliance partnerships or strategic partnerships, that's where the corporate, you know, uh, light bulbs come on. Uh, for this platform. So we're working with, you know, car dealerships. So every transaction, if you're getting an oil change, if, you know, you're getting a tire change at the, at the, at your car dealership, that transaction, uh, you have a choice to roll up and donate to HBCU change. Um, we can do, uh, we, we're doing a cents per change uh, platform as well. So we'll work with a grocery store and a specific brand. So if you buy a, a case of that product, a six pack or a 12 pack of soda for this product, it'll roll up to the nearest dollar and that change, every transaction will go to HBCU change. So strategic partnerships are huge <clears throat> opportunities as well. So I'm glad you mentioned that because we are tapping into that. So if you wanted to work with us, you can reach out to us at info at hbcuchange.com and we can talk about strategic partnerships, opportunities. All right, well, I love it, I love it. Now, now as for building an app, a lot of people here want to build an app or they're considering it. Um, why don't we walk walk down your experience and your path with that? Because I've heard apps can take anywhere from maybe forty thousand, a hundred thousand, all the way down to fifteen thousand, depending on how interactive it is. And then even after you have an app, there's millions of apps on the i on on the you know iTunes or whatever the case on the Apple Store, whatever it is. Um, how do you even get people to start you know going you know to the app? Because all of us right now have nine hundred apps on our phone, and we only use probably the top 15, right? So right. tell me the process of, of people right now wanting to build an app and what you went through. Absolutely. First and foremost is having your North Star. Why, why are you building this app? And what is the solution? You know, what is, what is the problem it's solving, right? When you identify, you know, your North Star and, and, and why you want to develop this app, and then you actually refine and come down to your mission statement of why you're doing it every day, the, the, the work that you're putting towards it, then you start to put a framework around it. All right, who's it going to impact and how is it going to impact their lives? And then the technology that's needed to translate that to an app. Um, and that's where a developer comes into, into, uh, into the picture because they can actually help with framing how that app will function and how a user will have their experience. The user experience is very important. You can have the right. best idea in the world, but if you don't uh, put a proper framework into position to you know, downloading the app to now, what is the first step on the app? All right, what's the next step after that? And that, when I say framework, actually step-by-step step what that looks like, what it feels like, and put yourself in that users uh, shoes to know what are the things they're going to look for? What are the questions they're going to ask? If they run into issues, who can they run it? Who can they, you know, reach out to? So is, is that function going to be available? So being, by being able to ask specific questions of how you want a user to experience your app to a developer will tell you everything about that, the, the developer. It'll let you know how experienced they are. Go ahead. Because I want, I want to know where do you get the developers? How do you source them? And what, what do you lay out? I mean, and, and I'm asking you because I've never, I, I've had people that build apps. Uh, so I'm not asking you because I know. I'm asking you because I really want yeah. to know. Um, what, wh how do you start costing out what you should lay out? And where do you find these developers? Yeah, you, you have to start with the budget. Know what your budget, your budget is and stick to it. It's the same as creating an event. It's the same as if you're going shopping, you have your budget. And if, but what's the low end? What's the low end? Five? One thousand? Fifteen thousand? What do you expect? Yeah. 
Yeah, so so to get a, a, a top notch at it's gonna start at least at twenty thousand dollars. Period. Twenty thousand dollars for <laughs> a where, okay. De right. Depending on, on how functional and, and what your app right. is. If you're if you're doing a blog app where I'm writing articles and every time I post my article is going to the app and people are just checking the app for content, you could develop that for a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars. I'm talking about business. If you're looking to actually have a functional app that's turning, it's not a hobby, it's a business, you're looking at investing at least $25,000 to get all the kinks out, you know, to do updates, um, proper, you know, uh, framework in order for it to function. For me, we were lucky. We have developer friends. Like, I always talk about having an advisory board of people who are in different industries, technology, finance, um, legal, to be, uh, to be able to tap into if you ever have an idea or a concept. So when we wanted to develop the app, we had a developer friend and we just asked them all the questions, you know, before we right. even took the step of investing. So we were afforded that ability. So that's the beauty of what LinkedIn does. LinkedIn, there are people on there who are developers. You can also uh, go on to Fiverr or, you know, one of these, uh, these apps to be able to find developers. There are developers throughout all these platforms that you can actually hire that might be sitting in India that might be sitting in Saudi Arabia and other countries that will do it. What will cost, you know, $20,000 to do here in the States can cost you $5,000 if you get somebody overseas. And how, how do, and, but, but everybody, I, I want you guys, whether it's a website being built or an app, you got to make sure that the person is reputable and you sign some kind of contract because again, you know, they can also hold you hostage to your product yeah. and or whatever the case is. And, you know, they may hit you back up later on. You owe, you owe me another five or ten. You don't give it to them, and then they they turn the whole damn thing off. So, it'd be extremely uh, like in any deal. Always have your paperwork, you know, written out and very very clear. Because if the foundation of the deal is not correct, you you leave yourself open for uh, you know litigation and or you know other kind of stuff. No, hundred percent. You have to do your due diligence, and that's with everything. You know, you have to check out the ratings if you're on one of the sites. You have to ask for references to be able to talk to people about it. You don't just jump off the bridge. Do your due diligence. Do your research. Ask the right questions. One of the things that we need to learn how to do is research. So being able to research and see, you know, some of the work that they've previously, previously done and reach out to those people to talk about that experience that they had with that developer and so forth. So it's any, any industry, definitely do the due diligence. Yeah. Now, anybody here, if you're a developer, you know, a good developer, please feel free to put it into the chat. Um, Steve, I want to ask you now, when you were at Miller Coors or advising Miller Coors or all said all those other things, if you're on that side of the table and a lot of people here right now want to get uh, sponsorship activations, maybe they have a product that maybe Miller Coors should, you know, buy, you know, 500,000 units to give away, you know, with the purchase <laughs> or whatever the case is, they got, they got a new, I don't know, box or something else like that. Um, what, how do you go about, first of all, getting the right contacts over there in each division that you want to go after, whether it is supply chain, whether it is advertising, marketing, yeah. whether it is sponsorship, how do you get to the right contacts and what do you need to do to skip past the noise. And I know it's not easy because a million, listen, if I get hit up a million times and I'm only one person, imagine, you know, mill of course, right? I mean, they, yeah. they, they got to be getting hit up a massive amount. But can you give us anything, any kind of, um, not secrets, but any kind of techniques you've seen that generally could work? And it doesn't mean that it's 100% guaranteed, but what you have seen work. Yeah, first and foremost, you, you have to have um, an understanding of what you're offering. Your true offering is to an organization. Because what tends to happen is we feel as if just because I have, a, you know, a thousand people that follow me or a thousand customers or 10,000 or I do events and I get 30,000 people doesn't mean that those 30,000 people are going to translate into supporting a strategic partner. You know, so it's understanding your demographic. You have to fully understand, understand who your audience is and break that down to the demo, their age demographic, where they live what they like, what they don't like. Uh, you need to tap into that audience and, and, and scale and break that down to understand who your audience truly is, package it in a one pager or deck and present it to the organization you're looking to partner with. Now, when I say that, understand that life is not cookie cutter. You can't just have one deck and feel like you're gonna pass that one deck out to 30 organizations and it's going to translate to all 30 organizations. Every organization is different. Every organization has different goals. 
every year they have goals that they're trying to achieve. It might be three years out they're trying to achieve this goal, innovation that they're trying to uh, achieve, uh, a specific audience they're trying to, you know, uh, appeal to. It can be this year we're trying to uh, speak to the 25 to 33-year-old African-American male. Next year can be, all right, now, you know, we want to reach out to the uh, Latina X community. Is there any... Is there any, Steve, is there any database or any way to collect where a company's agenda is? Because you're absolutely right. Listen, and so whether you're talking a huge corporation, you're talking about just pitching Damon John. If you pitched Damon John 10 years ago, you would realize that if you pitched me a clothing company, I had 10 of them and eight of them were dead. The last thing I wanted was another clothing company. If you pitch a venture capital company and you want, and I've shared this with people before, as you know this, Steve, you have something that is uh, argument's sake, it's medical tech, but you go and pitch a venture capital company, they only, uh, they only, uh, you heard about them, they into technology, but they're into financial tech, FinTech. Well, you pitch them something for a million dollars, it's in medical tech. First of all, their criteria is I got a hundred million dollars and I'm only going to invest in 10 companies. I don't want to write a hundred one million dollar checks i want to write 10 10 million dollar checks and they got to be in financial technology and i got to be able to get out of my business out of the investment in five to seven years you would have wasted all your time pitching them this idea that they no matter how great it is it just wasn't for them so when you look at miller cause or any of these things and they say well you know what we our agenda recently has been to market to the lgbtq community or to the young community or to the cause related community a social injustice community where do you find that uh criteria of what they're doing um the, to, the brand, to be able to tap in the brands tell you this again you have to do your due diligence and research on their website they're going to have information of uh the programming that they the programs that they've done what their agenda is what their sustainability report is that they they, re- they release every year they're going to tell you what's passionate to S- them sustainability report okay i like that Right. And it's going to tell you that. And then also look at Instagram, see what uh, advertisement they've been putting out, billboards, commercials. They're telling you who their audience is based off of who they're casting in the commercials. They're telling you who their audience is and who they're trying to attach ba- attached to based off the billboards and who you see in the billboards. They're telling you this. You just have to pay attention. And to find them, is, is, there's a few things you can do. One, again, you can go on LinkedIn and type in brand manager, procurement. Um, if you're looking to get a job, you can look into, uh, you know, uh, different titles that are within that organization. So, that so, so, so just, so, just so people know, procurement is the people that acquire the packaging and or the goods and stuff like that. So just so you know, to type in the right words, because people may say, I don't, I don't know what people, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not the brightest <laughs> tool in the shed, but I, I may hit up like, Yo, who be buying stuff over there? So it's called procurement. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, just so people know. Yeah, and you put in these titles and you'll find brand managers. These are the people that are managing the brands. You know, every organization with the Miller Coors, they have Miller Light, like, Coors Light, Blue Moon, Peroni. So there's a brand manager for each brand. So you're, you're going to be reaching out to a specific individual for that brand. So if you feel like the product or service that you're offering aligns with that brand messaging and what you see them doing in the market, that's somebody that you can align with and, and through your demographics of the research you've done of who your audience is and what you're offering, you put it in a one pager or a deck and you send it out, right, um, to attract. And then other ways is to attend different conferences. Right now is a little bit different because we're not actually attending CES or some of the big conferences across the country, but all the agencies are there. Those are the people that are actually coming up with the concepts for the organizations. So you, if it's not just learning who the people are inside the walls of that company, it's identifying who the agency of record is, which you can find online for these companies, because they're the people who are looking for the talent for programs. They're the people who are making some of the decisions of how the budgets are being spent. They're the people who are coming up with the creative ideas and concepts. They're the people who are suggesting different media outlets to align themselves with. So not in, in addition to the brand managers and procurement within the organization, you also want to find the agencies of record, of record and befriend those people because those are the people who are suggesting the ideas to 
the organization and the people behind those walls. I think you brought up another good point too. When you find agencies or records, think about this. The agency or record is supposed to, their job is to uh, spend money and get the brand out there. Um, so that's what they're looking for. And as well as you're giving them stuff that makes their job easier, whether ideas, concepts, products, or locations, whatever the case is. And that makes them that much better to the client. And also that agency or record has several uh, other clients. Usually yes. they're very, very big. So maybe if you're pitching them for uh, Miller Coors and it doesn't work for them, then maybe they have Ford. Maybe they have Apple, you know? So uh, I never thought about it like that. A lot of people do not pitch advertising and marketing agencies when they're really a lot of the ones who are coming up with the ideas and or executing the ideas for a brand. Also, yeah, you know, and, you and you have to think about it, right? Those are the people who are going out. Those are the people attending the conferences. Those are the people that are connected to the streets. But it's the agency that executes that plan and comes up with the nitty details that actually bring it to life. And you know what I've also seen also when, when people have ideas, concepts, or you know, you're looking for sponsorship or some kind of strategic relationship, they go right to marketing. But a lot of times I've seen people say, I'm going to take the same package and I'm going to put another spin on it that I sent to marketing and I'm going to send it over to the philanthropy side. Because yeah. philanthropy side, they don't get a lot of love, a lot of them, and they have money to yeah. really execute on the brand's behalf. So don't just think about this one area, especially if your product or you or whatever is going to create other change, which uh, is obviously going significant change. We, uh, we, yeah. we copyrighted that, right? Significant and, change. <laughs> right. And, I, and I think you made an, an excellent point because our tour, Miller Light Tap the Future, came from my community affairs budget, right? That right. was an opportunity for us to make a big brand smaller and, 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 and connected to, to the people. And through that budget and showing that we can still make impact and still impact the bottom line, the brand came and invested more into the program to expand it and make it bigger, right? Um, so to your point, you got to think about it. There's community affairs, there's sales, and on the sales side, those are the people that are retail. So in addition to sales, there's trade marketing. Trade marketing is the type of marketing that you do for big box chain, whether it's a grocery store or it's a convenience store, a C store um, or a package store, a liquor store. This marketing is very different from the advertisement, the above the line, the billboards, the TV uh, spots that you see. You know, when, you, when you're looking at how to actually market to somebody that goes into a grocery store, it's very different. So those are different budgets. You know, and then you talk about your alliance partnerships, your, your partnerships in marketing with, you know, your, your sports teams, having a partnership with the NBA team or an NFL team. That's a whole other approach of marketing within the organization. So to your point, Damon, there are so many pillars and opportunities for investment within a corporate space, but we tend to only focus on the marketing because that's what we see. We see the, the social media posts, we see the commercials, but we don't realize there's a whole other world and a whole other list of employees that are out there doing work that you can build relationships within your own community. What, uh, and, and, and I think to button up that part, I wanna get into something else with you uh, about how you work with brands, but, um, and, and other stuff in your book. But um, what trade publications have you been reading lately? And I, I know there's no, there are no more magazines, but in, back in the days when I was with FUBU, it was, uh, when I was doing FUBU, it was WWD. We would read, you know, Women's Wear Daily. We'd read other things. So are you reading Ad Age? Are you reading, where, where are people like you and brands really? I get it delivered, Ad Age. Ad, I get it Ad delivered Age. all the time. And, and there's something to online and there's something to actually flipping through the pages as well. If they're going to take time to actually put something in paper, it's something that you need to pay attention to, um, especially <laughs> now with technology. So Ad Age, Forbes and so forth. Uh, Blavity, I'm tapping into, you know, all the resources. Don't come on, man. You know, hey, you, you, you're too close to it. Stop running it off really quick like that. <laughs> Ad age. Because people are trying to write this down, Steve. Come on, man. Ad I'm, trying to, I'm said, trying to put out as much information as possible within within our window. So you, you have said Ad, Blavity. You have Ad Age. You have Blavity. You have Forbes. You know, these are, these are Inc. Uh, Inc. Magazine, uh, Black Enterprise. I tap into all these outlets because, again, organizations and, and, and companies are investing into these platforms um, at, for, as strategic partners because they have an audience they're trying to reach. So you're doing research in itself by acknowledging 
the advertisers within those pages or within that website to know who's spending right now, what they're spending on, and the audience they're trying to reach. And if you understand all those dynamics within each publication, each media outlet, you're already a leg up because you know who that audience is they're trying to reach. And you can tailor your pitch deck, your one pager to speak to that so they know that you understand the audience they're trying to reach. So it's very important to not only tap into these and just read the pages, but do your research, see what brands are spending dollars in those pages, see what events they're coming up with, what platforms they're leveraging. They're telling you everything within those pages. You just have to take a step back and actually take a deep dive and, and understand who, you know, what they're telling you within these, these pages or media outlets. So I want to, I want to talk really quick about, you know, how diverse, you know, um, you know, listen, you, you wrote the mind of a winner, but you, you also are very diverse in your mind and the way that you put things together. So you have one music fest, right? It's a yep. big music festival. How many people attended every year in we, Atlanta? We get, I was we get there 50, two years ago. Yeah. We got 55,000 people um, to Atlanta. Uh, it's the fastest growing progressive music festival in the Southeast. Okay, so s several different stages, and that's working. And mm -hmm. and then we did the Millicore Tap the Future. Uh, yep. Then you, you're doing the HBCU app. So you're showing yep. yourself in uh, pitch competition for this big brand, driving 50,000 people to a certain event in a certain uh, state at a very specific time. Very hard to move those type of people. Logistically, you know, putting it all together. Then you're talking about something where it's in fintech to, for, to some extent. And yep, you also, I remember you did something with uh, Kenny Burns. It was a small tour for women, I for, believe. For, what, for, for women only. Uh, uh, now, what was that tour? Tell me about that tour. Yeah, so for women only is was a platform that myself, Kenny Burns, and Anaton Bariola did. A five city tour across the country for women from married men. So there's always a lot of talk. Um, there's a lot of, you know, concepts, ideas. Um, but I, we never really saw anybody, um, especially from the married perspective, wanting to be vulnerable and share our actual insights of what we thought when we got engaged, how long, you know, before we got engaged, the process of going through marriage marrying somebody who's just as much of a boss as you and you know being able to handle that as a man um having an alpha woman um and being able to share those insights you know um and we did that tour across the country and we were having open dialogue with women and the conversations were amazing um to be able to to be that vulnerable and share the mistakes and share the things that worked for us it wasn't us telling women what to do and how to approach it it was sharing our experience and letting them react to it and then answering questions that they might have had on their mind. So it was definitely a five city tour we did, which was phenomenal. Shout out to Cavarcia, who it aligned with their, their, you know, their strategy. They were trying to appeal and uh, attract more women. Um, so it just made sense. Um, and we were able to, to bring that story to life and, and put together that five city tour. Yeah. So first of all, I truly believe in that um, because I always say that if you want to get the best insight on, um, you know, other people, you don't talk to people who are just like you. Men shouldn't talk to men about how right. to <laughs> deal with a woman. A man should get advice from women on yeah. how to deal with a woman and vice versa. You know, it's kind of like if we were going to fight the Russians, I want to, I want to, uh, you know, I want to hire a ex Russian military general <laughs> to get tell me insights. how, get how to get the insights of the Russians. So, yeah. um, but, I, but I say all that to say how, how diverse your offerings are. And in every one of those, you were able to bake it well enough to present it to Miller cause or present it to your sponsors for, uh, for the one uh, music or to Cavassier and stuff like that. Yeah. So just give me a little bit of your unique perspective on how you, um, you know, you're able to package that because that's really what you do. I mean, your company, your company is the one group, uh, uh, the one venture group, and you, you handle clients like maybe it's going to be some people here or obviously you handle big clients. How do you how do you do that and be so diverse at it? Because, you know, a lot, all of us get held back and we get put in a box. Before I was on Shark Tank, it was Damon John only knows how to sell baggy jeans. He's yeah. the hip hop guy. <laughs> He's going to come in the room, gold teeth, break dancing. Jeans hanging off his ass. You know, I mean, every and every one of us here are put into a box all the time. How do you present it and bake it well enough where you can pivot in those different ways and come up with unique selling propositions to people? Yeah, you know, at One Venture Group, we call ourselves social engineers. Um, there's a science to it. Like I said, 
you can't approach every situation as cookie cutter. We didn't take for women only and just blanket it and feel as if every brand could align or attach to it. We understood what our strengths were and what we were trying to offer. We packaged it. We understood who the audience was. We put it together. Um, and through us being social engineers, you know, we put together what the user experience would be. So we're doing this event. There's an opportunity for tasting. There's an opportunity for content that we can develop that has a shared message that you can share on your platform brand and our platform. There's an opportunity for us to expand, not only in your key target markets, but if there are other markets that you wanna expand and grow into, we can provide this offering into those markets. We're gonna have the audience there, and now your brand can come to life organically without you having to force a message uh, through social media, right? Um, it can be leveraged through our platform and our network because we know our audience best. So brand X, this is how your brand can fit into our world. It's the same thing working in corporate. You need to bring your authentic self. They don't hire you to come into an organization and be like everybody else. They hire you for you to come into the organization and lend your creativity, your ideas, your innovation into their world, right? So what are you offering to them? It's the same thing when we're working with brands. It's identifying the brands, I, obviously first is identifying the platforms and programs that you want to create and how it aligns with who you are um, and, and identifying your strengths and what you could bring to life and then identifying the brand. So for women only, we had a list of X, Y brands um, that we wanted to work with that we thought would fit for this platform. Same thing with One Music Fest, same thing with HBCU Change, um, same thing when I went on tour for The Mind of a Winner. So it's identifying which brands make sense to your organization and how you can bring their brand to life. I think where a lot of people go wrong is trying to, uh, one, force fit who your audience is to everybody, right? One, there's not enough time in the world. So the first five that you try to might not have made sense at all and you just lost two days. And now on day three, that brand, that the sixth brand you wanted to reach out, reach out to already has their plan baked. And if you reached out to me a week prior, possibly could have happened. So be very strategic and intentional with who you're reaching out to to make sure that one, it's a true partnership. That's why I hate the word sponsorship. It's a partnership. It's gonna benefit you brand and it's gonna benefit our platform. We're gonna come together to make magic. It's not about me trying to force my audience to you because my 50,000 people might not care about your product or might not be interested in your product. So it's my due diligence to do the research to understand my audience so I know when I'm reaching out to a brand, it makes sense. No, it makes sense too, man. And so I, I want everybody to be able to understand more about the way you think. And so, you know, make sure that they, they copy book. The, what, what was the book out about? Four years ago, you, you initially came out with it, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the Mind of a Winner. Um, really, there's a lot of stuff in there. And let's see, I got just some random questions. How tall are you? <laughs> I'm six six. So if I stand six, six, up, six, and, how, be... and how tall? How tall is your wife? My wife is six one. That's all. Well, I, everybody looks tall to me. I'm five well, seven and a half. You, that that time, half is really important. But every time you see her, she's in some heels. Outside of being on the court, she's in some heels. So in some heels, she could be six four, six five. How tall is Theo Ratliff? You think? Theo is about six ten, six eleven. I remember he 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 took one he he stayed in one of my homes for a while and I remember uh, you know like when you go to Miami my man and his wife is uh, really tall and my bed was you know my bed was probably about six feet um, <laughs> do you do your feet hang off the bed and, and shit like that when you go to hotels and stuff like that I'm just, <laughs> I just want to keep it one hundred this is important for me man I want to know shit like that like your feet your feet hang <laughs> off the bed so the secret. For a six six person to fit on any bed in the hotel is sit diagonally. So if I'm sitting side to side, then there's that fits for me. If I'm sitting, I know what if I sit from from top to bottom, then it's going to be a little bit tougher. Yeah, I never thought about that. So you sit diagonal. <laughs> I love that. Ha -ha. All right, man. <laughs> All right, man. Before you go, man, how 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 old is your boy now? Uh, he's three years old, and then we have one another that we're expecting in January. So we're gonna we're growing, we're growing our family, another baby boy. All right. Well, I'm gonna give you one. I'm gonna just give you a treat to give to him. You know, when he gets a little older. All right, Steve, you ready? Yep. All right. Why Why don't skeletons ever go trick or treating? 
<laughs> you got me. Because they have no body to go with. <laughs> 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 Come on. <laughs> They're going to get worse by tomorrow. They're going to get worse by tomorrow. Let that wash over you for a little bit. You know oh, what I mean? Oh, man. And my son I, loves I, skeletons, I, so that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is uncomfortable for you, man. You got to act like you give a shit and you're laughing. But no problem, brother. I love you, man. Happy Thanksgiving, love man. You Thank too, you so brother. much for everything uh, you do and you continue to do. Man, I look forward to seeing you and giving you a big old hug, brother. Absolutely. Happy holidays to you and the whole shark group family it's all love you know i love everybody so love you appreciate you and uh everybody don't be afraid of reinvention reinvention's a part of life you know just be, understand what your north star is and work hard and be courageous all right that's right that's right all right brother thank you hey you are you subscribed to make sure that you see all these videos with free advice chats and business experts and content that will motivate and inspire you if not come on hit the subscribe button and commit below is your chance to level up and learn every single week i'll see you in there